Good evening. Welcome to BourbonBlog.com's Quarantine Drinking Team Series. I'm Tom Fisher, host of BourbonBlog.com, and uh, this is Bourbon Blog's Instagram. If you're watching us right now, make sure you tell all your friends, come join us, because we're about to have some fun with my good friend, Colin Spoolman. He is the founder of Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, New York, and we should be all great, lots of great people uh, joining us now. Uh, Annabelle, Whiskey Boys, Tom Greener, all kinds of people. Uh, we're going to be pouring some of this live. Oh, and happy birthday to Tom. It's Tom's birthday tonight. Uh, Gambly J, Matty Roofer, thank you guys for coming back uh, to join us as we talk with Colin Spoolman. He uh, we had some technical difficulties. He'll be right with us. Until then, tell us down below what you're drinking. Um, I have several things lined up here. I have a little bourbon. I have some... Uh, what do I have? I have peated bourbon. Have you had the peated bourbon from Kings County? It's incredible. Uh, it's so good. Colin will tell us about it. And I have their chocolate, their chocolate whiskey. Uh, is Kings County peated bourbon and bottled in bond? Oh, okay, you're having both. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. He's having a lot of Kings County tonight. I was just there uh, at, in Brooklyn uh, right before the quarantine. I went to the gatehouses. They have their own uh, bar there, and they make 100% of what they do is with New York products, and they use their whiskeys and some other great New York ingredients. And it is uh, it's an incredible experience. If you've been to Kings County um, Distillery, tell us down below what you think of it. Uh, Colin should be here with us any moment. As I knows this, I'm going to tell you what I get. I did. There's so many. There's so much great brown sugar. Like almost burnt orange, uh, lots of depth on their bourbon. Their bourbon, to me, is one of the finest. I mean, it has a somewhat of a classic Kentucky taste, but it has its own. Um, it has its own flair. It has its own depth to it. It has its own terroir, which really makes it something so special. And it indeed is one of yes, Maddie. Yes, one of my favorite. Um, one of my favorite bourbons outside of Kentucky, really anywhere, uh, especially as far as craft distilleries go. Uh, Maddie's reminding us of where we met. We met at Seven Grand in downtown L.A. That was a lot of fun. Um, I host tastings when, when bars open or open and we can get together in groups. I do host tastings across the country. And one of our favorite places to go host tastings is at Seven Grand in downtown L.A. Um, Maddie, you're based there, right? I'm trying to remember if you're based there. Uh, Strom Beck D just joined us. I'm still looking to see if Kings County is joining us. I do hope Colin uh, Colin should be coming. It's it's one of those things of bringing these worlds together on one screen so that we can talk and have a sip. But for now, I'm having a sip with you guys. And uh, Chow, what are you drinking? Gene, Strom, Formax, lots of great people coming here. What are you guys trying? Tom, what are you having for your birthday tonight? Got, got several friends on here. So, bourbon is incredible. Who has tried it? Who has tried the Kings County bourbon? Show of hands down below. It's really nice. Uh, a little less than four years old. Taste a lot older to me. Uh, it's If I had to guess it, I think when I first tried it, I would have said... Um, I would have said it tasted more like uh, at least a six or seven year old bourbon, so we're really, we're really tasting something that has a lot of, a lot of depth to it. Um, I'm still looking for my friend Colin. I'm wondering if Colin is having more technical difficulties. Uh, I really do want to bring him into this broadcast, uh, though I'm really loving being with all of you drinking. Um, what are I drinking? I'm having the. Um, Kings County bourbon. And, um, hey, maybe, just maybe, I can get my producer who's watching to come this way. She's, I think, going to try to call Colin for us uh, if Annabelle's watching. She's going to come this way, see if she can get a hold of Colin, and see if we can bring him right in to this episode while you guys wait, because we don't want you to have to come back again. We're really having a lot of fun here. Uh, that you know, have you and and peated the peated bourbon? Has anybody had any of these three? I guess is the question because I do want to talk a little bit about these to you. Um, the peated, the bourbon, or the chocolate. Um, 
They are all really, really great. Give me a spoon. Hey, crap. All right, hold on one second. All right, here we go. We're back with you. Producer is Colin. Colin, thank you guys for standing by. I will, I will, I think I will wait to, so, so we had Angels Envy on last night, uh, we had Wes Henderson, uh, which all these videos, in the next day or two, we've been doing these for now about two and a half weeks, all these videos from Wes Henderson to Trey Zoller, uh, you can go to our YouTube, probably by this weekend, and watch all of these great interviews. Uh, we had a lot of fun the other night with Brian Nolt from Breckenridge Distillery, and I think that I see Kings County right now, we really appreciate you all, uh, Waiting for Kings County. But be watching on YouTube for all these videos. Here is Colin. Hey, Colin. Do you see it? I think I do. Okay. Hey, hey, there he is. Can you hear me, Colin? I think he can. Let's hear. Can you hear me okay, Colin? Hello, hello? I'm not hearing anything. Colin, can you hear me? Can anybody hear Colin, I guess, is the question. <laughs> we are, uh, can you hear Colin, Annabelle? Anybody tell us down below if you can hear Colin. Right now. Shoot. I think we lost him again. All right, we're going to try this again. You guys could not hear Colin. Okay, we're going to try this one more time. All right, here comes Colin Spoolman founder of Kings County Distillery. No. Okay, I can hear you now, Colin. There we go. All right. Hey, so, you know, it's just like any good bourbon, things take a little time. We're glad yeah. you're here. That's what matters is that you're here now. We've already been drinking a little bit ahead of you. We've been drinking a little <laughs> good, good, bourbon. Good. Yeah. Have you been you drinking should. some bourbon too? I have, uh, I've been drinking some peated bourbon. Well, uh, this is the peated bourbon and then some of our straight bourbon. Nice. I see a lot of bottles that look like this one behind you. Oh, yes. I have quite a collection of bottles. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, we can play Russian roulette with Kings County Archives. It's, it's good to stay stocked well. We had a good time uh, a few a few months ago, well, about a month ago, right before uh, quarantine. My team and I were there in, in Brooklyn uh, at your gatehouses. And your gatehouses, it's been there, what, for a couple years now? Yeah, I'd say... Um, yeah, almost going on a little more than three years, yeah. Great experience there. Um, and really, that whole area, uh, the Naval Yard there, is a, yeah. it's grown up so much since you've been there. Talk a little bit about the growth of Kings County. And for those who are watching that don't know what it is, you know, where is it and what is it? Yeah, so uh, we are almost now, uh, next week we will turn 10 years old. Congratulations. Which is quite a milestone, I have Which to say. Which day next week is the birthday? Uh, April 15th. April 15th. I think that's next week. Soon. <laughs> it is. Soon it is. <laughs> it's coming. Um, so yeah, so when we, we got started, I, uh, I, I grew up in Kentucky and, and mm -hmm. kind of got interested in distilling and, and distilling kind of moonshine. Uh, right. originally. And so got a little hobby still off the internet and played around with that in my apartment. And then that was around 2007. And then in 2009, realized that if I wanted to keep doing this without getting into quite serious trouble, I had to get a, a, a professional license to be a distiller. And so right. that, that began uh, the process of, of what ultimately became Kings County Distillery. Excellent. No, that's, uh, that's fantastic. So you, had, you started off moonshining a little bit, practicing as a, a home distiller on your own. Pretty much the entire business of Kings County was kind of predicated on this idea that if you made good white spirit, if you, if you focused on the distillate, what, come off, what comes off the still, that eventually, um, you know, as you age that whiskey, it'll be, you know, it's not going to get worse as it ages. Right. So um, 2010, we opened in a you know, some, I, I, I'm pretty sure it was April 15th is when we finally got our state license to begin distilling and uh, started to lay down some whiskey. And then uh, sometime in June, we're going to have our first seven-year-old whiskey. So as a distiller who produces all their own juice, you know, each milestone, when you cross a two-year threshold, a four-year threshold, or a seven-year threshold, 
um, it means a lot. It's it's a it you know feels like a very significant achievement. So right. Um, and and just you know any startup that stays in business for ten years. I mean you have to be very committed. I think it's a little bit easier as a distiller because you you know you you get into it for the long term. Right. <laughs> unless you're <laughs> unless you're delusional, you are getting it into it for the long term. So. Um, so yeah, so uh, you know, it feels like a, a little bit of an opportunity to take a victory lap. It's kind of a weird time to right. try to do that, but um, but yeah, I think um, we're gonna try and make it a milestone no matter what. Yeah, we got to celebrate no matter what because that is quite a milestone. Uh, Ten years, so it is. Even way back when you first started, it, you said you were New York City's oldest distiller, right? Yeah, yeah, we were the first distillery. Uh, to open within New York City, and we've always been focused on whiskey, and I think a lot of craft distillers will open and they'll do gin and they'll do vodka, but I was always interested in in whiskey, but did some unaged whiskey, some moonshine, some flavored moonshine, some, um, and that kind of allowed us to maybe have less of a pivot when when the whiskey actually came due. So. Um, We've we've dabbled in other spirits. We've made a brandy and some agave spirits, but um, ninety nine point seven percent of everything that we've ever made has been whiskey. And Kings County is in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is kind of a melting pot of many different cultures from around the world. So our goal, even though we the most of what we make is bourbon, our our opportunity, I guess I would say, is not to replicate what Kentucky is doing and to do a Kentucky style bourbon, but to say, hey, we're in the middle of Scotch culture, Irish culture, American whiskey, um, Appalachian moonshine. So how can we take those, all those different distilling cultures and put them together um, and, and make this kind of creative, <laughs> that's, my, that's my toddler. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, so we, you know, put them together to make kind of a creative um, fusion of different distilling ideas. Right. So um, we have a peated bourbon. We have an American single malt. We do uh, we do a traditional moonshine. We do a, a sort of mm, unusual bourbon, a high malt bourbon, high right. distilled bourbon. Um, so anybody who doesn't know Kings County, I would I would describe us as somewhere kind of existing between all these different cultures that we can kind of blend together and make our own. Well, let's start off by tasting some of the, uh, the straight bourbon whiskey. You have some mm -hmm. of there as well. I'll pour a little here. And, uh, you know, I've always said, Colin, your bourbon is, um, and your whiskeys are some of my favorite, uh, whether it's inside or outside of Kentucky. Uh, they, they're complex. There are. Yeah some of those Kentucky notes, but there's something even deeper that goes into the terroir uh, there in New York. Right. I guess I would say, um, you know, uh, terroir is a funny word as it, as it applies to whiskey, but for so long, Kentucky distilling really had the corner on the market. There were about 13 commercial distilleries, you know, Jim Beam, Jack Daniel, you know, Maker's Mark, all the ones that everybody knows. And there really wasn't a lot of variety. There was kind of a lot of brands in the market, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of um, legitimate differentiated small distilleries. Uh, that was something that died out when, you know, for instance, the Stitzel Weller distillery and Pappy Van Winkle, that was in the 60s, uh, late 60s, early 70s that that distillery shut, uh, kind of that, that family relinquished. So the idea of the small craft distiller you know, kind of died out in the in the 70s and, and didn't really pop up until the 80s on the West Coast and, and started to become really much more um, prominent in the 2010s when we first opened. Right. So um, uh, we start uh, as a Kentuckian, I love bourbon. So right. we, <laughs> we, were, we were always kind of making um, always our, our lead product was always a bourbon. Um, but then I think it, there was a question of like, how are you, what, what are you doing that is different? What are you doing that's, that's kind of expanding the category of American whiskey? Because for so long, it was Kentucky and Tennessee. That was the map of American whiskey. 
And if you look at a, a map of Scotch whiskey, you have all these different regions. And I think what we're coming to in craft distilling is moving more towards that era where there might be uh, a Northeast style whiskey, a Texas style of whiskey, a Pacific Northwest style of, of single malt whiskey. Um, so kind of these regional styles starting to develop. And so I don't necessarily know what the New York style of whiskey or the, New the Northeastern region of whiskey might be, um, but certainly rye whiskey is our heritage. So we've, uh, we do some rye whiskey. Um, but uh, bourbon is popular and, we're, we're, and I love bourbon, so we're always gonna make a little bit of bourbon. So this is 80% New York State corn, 20% English malted barley, and it's pot distilled. So pot distillation is kind of, when you look at the world of distilling, there's a column still that's much more efficient, usually much associated with much larger operations than we are. And then you have pot distilling and that's uh, uh, a more labor intensive process, but, but really gives the distiller more latitude over the finished product. Um, and so all of our distillation, even back when we were in a little closet in, in Bushwick, um, we, we've always used pot stills. And as we've grown the business, we've gotten bigger pot stills, but they've always been pot stills and we haven't really done column distilled whiskey. So for bourbon, that remains fairly unusual by not using a, a rye or wheat as a flavor grain, as they would call it, um, that, that differentiates a little bit from uh, uh, a sort of standard bourbon. So we do a high malt pot distilled, open fermented, off the grain fermented. Um, and so far we've been using small barrels, but as of June, we start to see the first waterfall of our full size barrels come due. So we've always been laying down whiskey for the long term, and and that's what's uh, we're about to start seeing. That's that's great, and this and so I've always thought this this bourbon, um, it it has a nose of something that has much more age. It yeah. tastes a lot deeper than something just under four years old uh, or about four years old. What gives it that bigger flavor? So I think that's that's one of the prevailing myths of whiskey is that age is the primary determinant of quality. And in fact, it's not, it is, right. it is a significant contributor to quality. But I've always looked at our business this way. If we're gonna make an unaged whiskey, we're gonna do different choices about the production. If we're gonna make a two-year-old whiskey, we're gonna aim the whiskey in that direction. If we do a four-year-old whiskey, we do different things. And we do a seven-year-old whiskey, we do different things. So for our um, four-year whiskey or a two-year whiskey, we're using a smaller barrel typically um, and we're making much narrower cuts off the still. So we're, we're putting better whiskey into the barrel, using a smaller barrel to get more surface area contact. That's not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that that makes the whiskey mature faster, but I'm just saying if you're making a two year old whiskey, you might want to use a smaller barrel than a 53 industry standard size barrel. Right. Um, so, so we play around and, and that's, not unusual for scotch whiskey or any world whiskey that people use different size barrels and they blend them together. Um, that's always been a big part of our production. And I'll say, you know, um, Ryan is our current head blender, but many craft distilleries, they have a head distiller, but they don't necessarily always have a head blender. And that's been very important for us to always have both, uh, leadership on the distilling side, but also leadership on the blending side, because there's, there's sort of the, the before the barrel and the after the barrel process. You and really so, take a look at, at what should be blended together to give you consistent flavor. Right, right. And as a testament to that, Nicole Austin, who was our first head blender, right. is now, as you know, the head distiller at, at George Dickel in Tennessee, Cascade right. Hollow Distillery. And so um, when Diageo, which is the largest spirits company on earth, <laughs> hires your talent, Theoretically, it says you're doing something right. I don't know if that um, yeah, has <laughs> quite, you know, reached uh, reached the level of everyday understanding. But um, you know, it, it, I took it as a thing that was. I take it as a point of pride, and Nicole's obviously a, a, a great distiller, and will do great things with George Dickel. Right. So uh, you know, we really do put emphasis on blind tasting, um, making sure that there's a lot of integrity. It's not just about a mash bill and an age statement. It's about here's a human being that's trying this whiskey and, and sharing it with the world. 
And so I'll just say at the San Francisco World Spirits Competition, which, you know, they hand out a lot of medals, but it's, it's for a distiller, that's a room of your peers. That's journalists, that's bartenders, that's people who are constantly in the spirits business who are surrounded by spirits all day long. They're sitting in front of a table. They don't know where anything comes from and they pick your spirit out of a lineup. So our um, bottled and bond uh, bourbon and our rye whiskey just both uh, both won double gold medals and the bottled and bond won the best bourbon at San Francisco in the under five year old category. And so that was just great. Just, re just the last few weeks that came out. Just, uh, yeah, like a week ago. A week ago, yeah. Congratulations yeah. on that. And yeah, well thank you. Yeah, and, uh, and the depth, let's go to the flavor what we get. Many people watching have tried it, for those that haven't. Um, right off the top, there's a depth on this bourbon uh, yeah. that I don't get on any other younger bourbon. Right, right. So I would say that's, uh, that has a lot to do with uh, two things. I'll say that's small barrels, which give you more flavor in a short amount of time. Right. But also pot distillation, which is just one of those things that's like kind of a nerdy kind of dis distillers obsess over it, but it doesn't necessarily translate to a general understanding of whiskey. But uh, single malt scotch, for instance, must be pot distilled by the laws of scotch whiskey, by this, you know, their, their rules. Um, it's not something that's been as popular in the United States or in North America, but um, pot stills to my palate yield a much more um, viscous, you get a, a lot of a more buttery mouthfeel out of a pot still. So you get a richer, a richer whiskey from, from the pot still. And um, even at two years, you get something that, that actually tastes above its age in terms of its flavor profile. It's so, richer just right there from the beginning, that buttery note. Yeah. And that's due to the distillation, that's due to the aging process, that's due to we use organic New York State grown corn. It's, it's not the sort of commodity corn that you might get from just buying it on the open market. We use a very specific farm that we go to year after year, um, Lakeview Organic Grain in Penyan, New York. So, you know, a lot of our decisions at the distillation level are for quality versus yield. And, you know, it's interesting to look back at the history of whiskey. Jack Daniel, one thing that he always talked to was yield per bushel. And that was the amount of whiskey that you took from a bushel of grain. And his yield was like two and a half gallons per bushel of grain, whereas the prevailing commercial product was three and a half gallons per bushel of grain. And I don't know what our ratio is, but we certainly get a lot less yield for the amount of that we use than, than the commercial distillers that are, um, you know, the large distillers, I'll say. Right. And the types of pot stills you're using, is this something that is, is fairly uh, unique to craft distilling as far as uh, compared to other craft distillers? Yeah, I mean, we're, I, I would even argue that we're fairly unique even among craft distillers in the right. thing. A lot of craft distillers use a hybrid still where you have a rectification system where you can kind of alternate between I want a pot distilled spirit or I want a rectified spirit and you have some flexibility and that's called a hybrid still and it's usually they're made in Germany. But we use stills, uh, four size stills that are made in Scotland that are really designed for whiskey only um, and, and aren't really all that well suited to making other types of spirit. We could do tequila type spirit, we could do brandy type spirit. These are other pot distilled sort of flavor forward, heavy, oily, rich charactered spirits. Um, but we're, we're whiskey people, so we do whiskey. Right, a lot of, a lot of uh, great people coming in. If you have any questions for Colin Spoolman, founder of Kings County Distillery in Brooklyn, New York, asking down below, and we're gonna continue to enjoy this bourbon. Uh, and then we'll move on in a moment here, Colin, to the peated bourbon. I have a little of a peated bourbon with me here. Oh, good, 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 yeah. Uh, just all kinds of great spirits. Someone asked a moment ago about uh, single barrels. Um, you do have some single barrels. Those are mainly only available at the distillery, or tell us about that. Yeah, right. So I think when you were at the distillery last, you tried... Um, so Ryan, who is our head blender, will occasionally pull barrels out of the lineup and say, this is something very, very special. Let's hold this for ourselves. 
<laughs> so that's our that's our blender select line. We currently have um, uh, a barrel proof rye whiskey, uh, a barrel strength peated bourbon, and a five year old straight bourbon in that group. And we can send those barrels, uh, we can send those bottles anywhere in New York State right now. Um, cool. So that's kind of an opportunity. We have these things that are distiller exclusive, but if you happen to live in New York State, um, <laughs> they're now they're now New York State exclusive whiskeys. Uh, so if you're but, watching from New York, where can they order them? Uh, through our website, kingscountydistillery.com. Just go to the website, kingscountydistillery.com. You can order those very single barrels. Or once things get back up and going, you can go try them. Um, we tried some single barrel flights that were just incredible. We had a uh, wine barrel finish. One yeah, time. yeah. What was? Remind me what kind of wine that was. I'm trying to remember. Uh, the New York wine. I think. <laughs> well, it's funny. We, we're currently aging a wine that I, I really don't know <laughs> what the, it's like a very obscure varietal. Um, but that particular varietal was from Macari Vineyards, and I think it was a Cabernet Sauvignon. So not super obscure in that regard. Um, but we're always kind of playing with a few things that we want to keep, you know, we're, we're, we're very, uh, I, I hope to be a very creative distillery and to sort of yes. play with the rules and to always, if you come visit us at the distillery, you always have something very unusual, something we're probably not going to replicate, stuff that we just kind of, we, we play a lot and we share that with people who come visit us. Some of those end up becoming core parts of our lineup. So right. the Peter Bourbon, for instance, Peter. once was a distiller exclusive. It was something right. that we... Um, we're kind of playing around with Rob Easter was our distiller when we came up with that. Uh, <laughs> he came up with, and um, you know we didn't know what it would be, but we we immediately after a year of aging, we're sort of like, oh, this is a good project. Let's do a lot more of this. What uh, is now, the Peter Bourbon? So the Peter Bourbon is now our number two bestseller. Wow. We make this with seventy five percent New York State organic corn, twenty five percent. Peated malt that comes from Scotland, from near Aberdeen. So it's not it's not the Isla peat, which can be this sort of briny, smoky kind of medicinal character. But this is more the barbecue peat that that uh, is more mainland Scotland. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's it's a it's a but but it's lightly peated. You're not going to confuse it for Ardbeg. You're not going to confuse it for Laphroaig. But it has that Scotch note. It has a touch of scotch on the finish, right. which I think is just a fun thing that there really is, um, you know, High West does a campfire where they blend scotch and right. bourbon. Um, but as far as I know, we were the first to actually use a peated malt to make a bourbon whiskey. Yes. And so uh, our, our peated bourbon has been around probably about five, six years now. Um, and it's a really cool whiskey. If you're into scotch, if you're into bourbon, but you want to see them together that's that's a great whiskey to try it's a mixture of both uh let's give it a you have a little there yeah 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 excellent we'll give it a taste uh few comments whiskey boys from connecticut says connecticut loves king's county uh, yeah someone from uh north carolina someone also says please don't change the bottle or the label uh, <laughs> yeah. just always this was what inspired my pro, like pre-prohibition or prohibition type style whiskey or I'll just say, um, when I was, uh, so, you know, I got started distilling in my apartment and, you know, didn't fuss with the labels. And I think I have a picture here of when I was like in my, in my youth. This is, cool. that's how we first started. So that's mason jars with these like little strips of tight <laughs> neon labels. Um, <laughs> eventually my business partner, David, was sort of like, you gotta lose the neon. That's not doing anything for us you know, keep it a little restrained. So, but but I think what, what it does actually is it helps to articulate how, you know, the variety of the whiskeys that we have. You can see behind me, all these different whiskeys. We, we just play, we right. just play all day long. And, and um, you know, I, I think our ability to be creative is our opportunity because we're never gonna be competitive on price. We're never gonna be competitive on age. You know, we're in, we're in New York City Distillery. It's the most expensive city in the country. So uh, our opportunity within 
American whiskey is to, is to be creative and to do things that people haven't had before. So a lot of our thought process when we're developing whiskeys is, is this something that's differentiated enough from Kentucky bourbon, Tennessee whiskey, even, you know, sort of rye whiskey? What are we doing that's different, that's unique, that's special, that people can't get from any other distiller? Um, that, that's usually how we frame the whiskey, the, what we're after. Well, this Pete, I'm, I've always been a fan of this. And yeah. I heard this a few weeks ago at uh, the International Restaurant Show of New York, more like a month ago. Uh, but there's a great so softness on this. It's soft. There's a heated nature. It is really the best of both worlds. Yeah. Those sugar Very subtle on the peat. People hear peat, and, and I, I go to Kentucky and Tennessee where people are yeah. you know, very classicist as it, as it applies to American whiskey. Right. Like, yeah, I don't do peat, but but then they try it and they're like, oh yeah, that's actually not too heavy. It's and, well balanced. It's not. Yeah, a, it's yeah. not too much of either, which I think makes the perfect whiskey. Um, right. So this is this is your second number. Two second most popular to the bourbon. Yeah. Right. Our straight bourbon. Um, that's the most popular whiskey we make. Yeah. How many How many states are you in now, Colin? We're in about twenty states, mostly northeast, east coast. Um, we, we do distribute to a lot of countries. We're in seven countries, but um, really our core audience is New York City, tri-state area. That's where we do a lot of business. That's, it's, it's such great stuff. Again, any questions you have or comments for Colin Spoolman, tell us down below. Colin also has, uh, he's an author of a couple of books, one on urban moonshining and the other on some dead distillers. Yeah, so if you want to make your own whiskey, <laughs> Which is, which is totally illegal. So I cannot advocate doing that. But if you were to want to do that, this is a great book that you should, you should purchase. <laughs> it's available on Amazon. Uh, go get that. Um, this book, very unpopular. Nobody has bought this book. But as a whiskey distiller, it is the story of Jack Daniel, of Jim Beam, of all the great distillers. Uh, three US presidents were distillers, George Washington. Yeah. William Henry Harrison and Andrew Jackson. Fun fact, uh, they were all distillers at one point in their lives. Um, so we go into that in this book. It's kind of a cool, fun, <laughs> you have to really love whiskey to get into this book. But cool. um, uh, I, I personally am a, I, I love history and, and, and the culture of whiskey. And that's certainly my approach to making whiskey. Um, kind of draws on that um, history and culture that we've all come from. Right. So uh, as, a, as a distiller, I like to pay a lot of attention to what came before and how can we contribute to that sort of historical tradition that's, uh, that's been going on. Now, the beauty of whiskey is it, it, it has lasted since the beginning of America. So um, to be able to contribute to that is, is unique in the way that there are so few consumer products that have lasted for hundreds of years in the way that whiskey has. So um, to do something that's very traditional, very old fashioned, very kind of, um, you know, sort of outside the, the digitized tech <laughs> Instagram live world that we live in it is a way to kind of connect to the, you know, the, the continuity of the human condition and, right. uh, you know, that's that's fun. That's a that's a cool opportunity to have as a distiller. Yes, it's, and whiskey does connect us to something that is timeless. And um, as we look at what's happening now, we definitely want to mention uh, all the great work your team's doing there at um, Kings County. You guys have been making hand sanitizer and a few things. Yeah. Like yep. Yeah. So you know, it's it's funny as a distiller, you're you're constantly aware that you make this ethanol which is uh, a chemical that is useful for <laughs> beverage purposes but also useful for industrial purposes like fuel it's a it's a, a solvent it's a cleaner so you know for a while we were sort of like oh, we could we could always get into the hand sanitizer business as a joke but um things changed in the in the way that things were happening and then we were like well actually you know if we did make hand sanitizer that would actually be very I think useful to our community and to our neighbors. So I think it was starting around maybe 
first week of March, we said everything that we produce from this point forward, we're going to produce for hand sanitizer. And again, as a, as a whiskey distiller as a, and using pot stills, we're really not very well set up to make hand sanitizer. Um, but we do a triple distillation or a, we can do a double distillation. We run very slowly and get up to above 84% alcohol is the threshold that we use. And then we mix it with hydrogen peroxide, glycerin, and that is the WHO World Health Organization recipe for um, kind of hand sanitizer that you can make anywhere in the field. Hydrogen peroxide and, and glycerin are very common ingredients. And TTB, which is the agency that manages beverage alcohol in the United States, it reviews all our labels, it, it, it writes all the code that we you know, uh, abide by as distillers. They said, if you follow the WHO recipe, you can do a hand sanitizer. So we launched that, I wanna say it was about a week and a half ago, sold out, <laughs> sold out in like four hours. Wow. Had to retrench, uh, make a lot more. And now we have uh, released it to New York State and hopefully soon we'll get back to being able to ship it anywhere in the country. Um, but, you know, it, it's just a thing that we can do. It makes people feel safer. It makes people, you know, it's, it's we've donated to hospitals. We've donated to fire department, NYPD, um, trying to get it in the hands of those essential workers that have to be out in the field every day, regardless right. of what's going on. And that's really what you guys have focused on the last several weeks. Yeah, it's a, it's, it, it's a weird business pivot because yeah. for really a third of our income came from our tours and our um, cocktail bar and um, tastings flights that we did. And so to have that shut down, it was, you know, we could walk away and go home and hope for the best. But, you know, I think the better solution was to say, let's figure out, this is what we're good at. We know how to make alcohol. <laughs> we can't make it cheaply. God knows we make it the best that we're like the most expensive distillery in the, on earth. Um, but we'll be transparent with people and we'll say, you know, a dollar buys the packaging and the corn and $5 buys the ingredients and the packaging and $10 buys the labor and $20 buys the revenue that we would have made if we sold this as whiskey because it's 84% alcohol. Normally we sell, you know, 40% to 45%. So almost double the amount that we would put into a bottle of whiskey ends up going in a bottle of hand sanitizer. But, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a weird time and, and this is what we can do. So we're going to do that. And so far, you know, people have appreciated it. And yeah. I, I give great credit to our neighbors and community in New York who um, saw what we were doing, appreciated it, uh, told their friends about it. And, uh, you know, we'll, we will be around as long as this goes on, as long as we can make that sanitizer because it, it, people keep, people need it. People need it, yeah. And that's great that you guys are doing that. And uh, as, you, as you are a, a, a fan of history, as am I, as you look at what's happening right now um, uh, during COVID, you know, an unprecedented time, restaurants, bars closing, um, yeah. you don't have a lot of... Uh, fans uh, of your whiskey at restaurants and bars in, in New York in that area. How is this going to, um, I mean, obviously, we're, we're, we really, first of all, really feel for everyone that's out of work, bartenders, hospitality industry. But on the whole, how do you think this is going to affect um, craft distilleries, distilleries, your distilleries? Um, if, if it continues, how will it affect everyone? Yeah, I mean, in, in all Honestly, my, my view is that it's going to make the, the, the people who can afford to weather the storm will weather the storm, and those that cannot will not. And it will make right. those of means will be around, and those who are, you know, the, and, and I, <laughs> I put, the truth is I put Kings County in the group of people who are, who are not uh, we're very well financed and, and sort of on the, living day to day and then were it not for the ability to make hand sanitizer, I don't know that we would survive this. So I feel very much uh, in kinship with the bars and restaurants that um, are the small businesses that have had to close, that have had to pivot, that have had to do takeout and delivery, if they were even able to do that. Right. So, um, 
you know, I think it will devastate the hospitality industry. And I feel very fortunate on one hand to maybe be in a position, it's like, who knows how long this will go on. I don't even know if this is gonna last. But, you know, I think we have charted a course that will allow us to survive. But, um, you know, the, the places that I love that, that I want to be there when we come back, I, you know, I have no particular certainty. So I would just say to everybody, you know, there's a, this stupid debate of whether or not you should even go to get takeout and to go patronize those businesses that are still around. For, for God's sake, go please do patronize those businesses. Yeah. If you feel like that's risking your life, don't. But if you don't necessarily feel like that's risking your life, um, I, th I think the value far outweighs the risk. And so people should go to those places and get taken out and try to keep um, a few places, you know, going. So, keep on supporting yeah. local, and, and people can come uh, buy bottles to go from you. You've got all your hand sanitizer, but you can buy your whiskey to go too, right? Yeah, right. So uh, certainly our hand sanitizer, whatever you can pay, uh, minimum ask is a dollar per bottle, but, uh, you know, hopefully anybody can afford that. Um, but, uh, you know, pick up a bottle of whiskey, that's what really helps us stay in business. And we do sell all of our distillery whiskeys, distillery exclusive whiskeys, allocated whiskeys, things that are hard to find. If we have it, we'll sell it to you if you're in New York State. <laughs> so, but, you know, it's funny, a lot of our dist uh, distributors around the country have great supply of very coveted whiskeys like our Empire Rye whiskey. Yes. Uh, or, or barrel strength whiskey. Um, there are pockets of those whiskeys that um, were sold out in New York, but you can find them in various places around the country. So um, if you're at all a fan of Kings County, you, it, we're one of those brands where you really have to ask for it at your liquor store, make them go to the distributor and you know, uh, uh, get them to send whatever's left in the closet uh send it to your store that you love to patronize um that's what's going to help us so um you know please do that if you're yeah in keep on telling them to uh to order the i mean we, we were really lucky that uh a, a restaurant slash bar uh local here at the border of indiana kentucky started carrying it um, yeah uh, uh in twine not too long ago and, and others that have have really gotten excited about it. Um, I was really thrilled, as I was telling you earlier, to try the, the five-year-old uh, bourbon, yeah. uh, which yeah. was just divine. I mean, just to taste something uh, that old. The seven-year-old is going to be out uh, around when, do you think? Well, the barrel turns seven years old in June, so mm -hmm. imagine maybe a couple weeks to bottle it and package it. Um, we've actually got some six and seven year old whiskey that's around the distillery but yeah. we don't always release every right. <laughs> six and seven year old whiskey that we make some of it is just sort of a teaching tool to our staff so we have some kind of overage whiskey that isn't you know that that we, we we knew it was not headed in the right direction but we said let's just let this go for six or seven years just to prove the point <laughs> that it's not purely about the age statement and uh, if you come to Kings County Distillery, uh, in the, you know once this all settles down, hopefully ask for the un overage whiskey, and you'll get to try the seven-year, five-gallon barrel whiskey that is, <laughs> uh, you know, fun, weird. Nobody makes anything like that, uh, but it's not. You know, our our seven-year-old whiskey is going to be. Is that going to be just the distillery, or will it be a limited release everywhere? It's it's hard to know. I mean, hard to know. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, chances are the way things are going, it'll be a distillery exclusive. But it begins a waterfall of seven-year-old whiskey. So we've always been setting aside fifty-three gallon barrels. That's a sort of Kentucky industry standard size. And as far as I'm concerned, as Kentucky bourbon goes or Tennessee whiskey, you know, fifty-three gallon barrel that's got to age for at least seven years. So that's just the moment where we start tasting those barrels. And so we have devoted about a quarter of all of everything that we distill goes to that seven year old or, or even longer age that we might come out with in the future. That's something that we set aside. So that's a quarter of it you're, you're, you're putting to that seven mark. Yeah, so a quarter of everything that we distill will go at least seven years. At least seven years. That'll be um, that'll be so nice um, yeah. to try some of that. And again, one of my 
favorite uh, distilleries, experiences, um, and just and you're one of my favorite guys to visit, Colin. I'm so glad to have you on. It's, you. it's a lot of fun to, to talk with you and, and just, you know, to, to bring everybody together. Tell us down below again what you're having. Are you having Kings County or just tell us what you're drinking? Um, and let's try, before we leave you, let's try some of your chocolate flavored whiskey. Oh, yeah, yeah, bring that up. Yeah, and a peanut was amazing. These were the three I had, and I wanted to make sure we tried these. And uh, this is uh, this chocolate whiskey has always been. This was was this after you did the moonshine? Then you released the bourbon. Was it this the third product you released, or was this was the third product that we released? Third. But it, it was really, I mean, it is. I would put it in the category of unaged whiskeys. I mean, it is right. a, a flavored whiskey, legally and and practically. So what we do is we take our white dog boonshine, whatever you want to call it, and then we infuse it with the husk of the chocolate that is a byproduct of a chocolate factory that is just down the street from us. Yeah. Um, and so we get flavors that are alcohol soluble that would not necessarily be water or fat soluble, things that are useful to a chocolatier. And like the oak of a barrel, which is only nobody, the only way to get flavor from oak is to store alcohol in it we can get flavor from the chocolate pod, the chocolate husk through this infusion process. So our chocolate whiskey is an infusion of chocolate husks. Very bitter, very weird. People, I think, maybe want something sweeter, like a liqueur. This is more in the Italian digestif yes. uh, kind of cocktail bitter ingredient kind of realm. It's a dessert whiskey. It's a weird whiskey. Um, the bitterness is so beautiful, though, and and that's what that's what that byproduct tastes like. I mean, that's what yeah. the, the true raw product is. Yeah. So people who kind of hear chocolate whiskey and they're like, oh, "I bet I'll love that," tend to not like it. And people who think they're gonna, um, you know, hate it, end up being like pleasantly surprised. So, beautiful. Yeah. It's it's a it's a fun whiskey to share with people who come to a distillery and they're expecting, you know, bourbon rye whiskey that's very different from any of that. Um, but I, as a, you know, as an Eastern Kentucky sort of moonshine person, <laughs> you know, I'm kind of like, why not do a flavored whiskey? Why not make something, um, if there's going to be Fireball and Tennessee Honey and some of these sort of mainstream sort of commercial broad audience flavored whiskeys out there let's do something that's kind of sophisticated that's, that's aimed at a much narrower audience that ends up being kind of unique and 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 interesting for what it is so i put the chocolate whiskey in that category yeah it's so nice great on its own on the rocks do you have any cocktails or anything you like to put this in we do we do uh i mean certainly irish coffee is a great you know sort of opportunity for that just on its own or over ice cream as a dessert sort of, <laughs> you know, unusual thing to offer. Right. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a weird one that I think people should play with and have fun with. And I mean, we, I've done one of the best cocktails I've ever had actually was in Houston, Texas. Somebody made a kind of a Mexican hot chocolate with oh. chocolate whiskey, spicy, chocolatey, bitter, rich, Totally delicious. Um, do you, well, what do you know? It was in that, or was it just more? It was there's an Ancho Reyes. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. You know, liqueur. So it had that sort of spice. It had the um, a little mm -hmm. sweetness from a from uh, I can't remember what the simple syrup was, but anyway, it was it just a there's a lot to play with with chocolate whiskey, and I think our we 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 mostly make sipping whiskeys that are not necessarily cocktail aimed. But the chocolate whiskey, I think, is is definitely one that if you're into really weird cocktail ingredients, the chocolate whiskey is absolutely up your alley. It's beautiful stuff. It's um, it's it's well rounded. It has uh, it has almost some some um, it has this dusting of cocoa notes almost like you've just opened up and you've nosed some really beautiful cocoa, some coffee notes. I mean, there's so much. Yeah, going it's, on. it's again, like a, the chocolate company is what's the name of the Rocker? Rocka chocolate. So for a long time, we were using Mass Brothers. They moved out of Brooklyn. So we wanted to find a, a local supplier. So we've transitioned to Rocka and they do um, raw chocolate. They don't ro roast their beans in the way that we had always done before. 
So our chocolate whiskey is a little different now than it, you might be used to if you're like a, a longtime fan. But, um, you know, it still remains uh, a kind of niche, unusual thing that um, really derives a lot of its, its integrity from the, the, the supplier that we're using. So um, totally interesting spirit that um, if, in terms of a whiskey distiller, I don't think people would necessarily expect, but um, I, you know, I like to defy expectation. I like to, dis to, to, you know, make, make stuff that people think they don't want, but they want. We, we have a honey whiskey that we're working on. Um, we've come out with a honey whiskey, honey moonshine before, but mm -hmm. this one is bees that, um, live in the Navy yard. So they're, they're, they're our neighbor bees. So, <laughs> uh, you know, keep it as local as possible and uh, as legitimate as possible. So that's something that's going to come on the horizon, uh, depending on how long this goes on. You know, we're going to keep making stuff and and uh, sharing it with people. So the Honey Whiskey is a project that's on the horizon. More that's chocolate whiskey, seven-year-old bourbon, hand sanitizer, local delivery to New York State. And also, I will just add to this. Yes. Uh, we do uh, virtual tasting. So our tour guides, we had tours of the distillery. All those uh, people have been, you know, furloughed. <laughs> so, but, right. but if you want to go to our website, we do, if you are in New York State, you can get a three bottle pack of whiskey or a five bottle pack of whiskey. And then you can have one of our staff walk you through and really educate you on those whiskeys and why we make those whiskeys. So that's another thing that we have going on is the virtual guided tasting uh, that we've been hoping to, you know, uh, people are bored, you know, people want to have. And so how does that work? Someone, you will actually have the whiskeys in front of you and someone will be talking. So yeah, you, you order a, a five pack of whiskey. You'll get five different whiskeys in a box. You get a, a, a little tasting book like this that walks you through what all the whiskeys are. Right. And then one of our staff will Skype in or Google Hangout, whatever your preferred mode of uh, com conversation with our staff is. And, and they'll walk you through the history of Kings County, walk you through the different whiskeys that you're trying. And I don't know, we'll see how it goes. We're, we're trying to- as And you just the, started those. We just started those. We, yeah, we've, so we've had about 15 people sign up for that. And, um, you know, it's, it's a way to take what we had done in the past, which was very good business, which was our sort of private tastings, a tour of the distillery, and then you, you really get walked through a, a very precise private tasting. Um, you know, people are, they, they want to do something fun at home and something they can't do. This is absolutely something where you can and, and learn about different uh, whiskeys that we make. And I don't know, it's a way to pass the time. That's, absolutely. That's what it's all about right now. So it's, uh, again, find out about all that on the Kings County website. Uh, yeah. Someone also mentioned they like your grapefruit habanero. Grapefruit jalapeno, yeah, yeah, yeah. Jalapeno, jalapeno. That's, a, that's, yeah. A, that's a classic summer whiskey that we make. Yeah. Um, absolutely coming back this summer. So regardless of how long this goes on, we're going to bring back the jalapeno grapefruit. Um, it was a great ingredient for like a, a, a whiskey-based margarita for, for everybody who's been wanting to make a whiskey-based margarita. <laughs> we're here for you. We have the grapefruit jalapeno moonshine that uh, that is that is great yeah and and some great cocktails uh at the gatehouse was it your uh, manhattan or old-fashioned that uses the peated bourbon in the manhattan the uh let's see the one of them the old-fashioned is our where we, peated. Di, where we use the peated bourbon we yeah, also have penicillin which is kind of a, a scotch whiskey cocktail but we do that with our peated bourbon as well um, pita bourbon is a really versatile ingredient in a cocktail because it does have that smoky angle. You have the, sh the sort of classic sweetness of a bourbon. So um, it's, a, it's an undiscovered spirit as far as cocktails go, as far as I'm concerned. Oh, but, it's amazing. Uh, and just the experience to visit uh, the distillery, the, the building, the distillery, and the gatehouses are in date back how far? The gatehouse is 1896 and the distillery yeah. is 1899. So um, our, our campus has been around since the early days of the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, 
And so it's, it's a cool spot, a lot of history. Al Capone was born across the street from us. <laughs> who, who knew, but we'll take it. Um, he contracted syphilis very close to us. <laughs> so <laughs> very colorful, rich history um, in, in our part of, we're, we're in a very old part of Brooklyn, the sort of old you know, Irish neighborhood. So, uh, uh, which became an Italian neighborhood, but, but yeah, it's, it's a fun, if you, if you like whiskey and history, definitely come to Kings County once we're back open. Yeah, visit these guys, try their whiskeys, get them local, order them across New York, or if they're across the country, where's the best place to order your whiskeys online? I mean, I'll just say, I, I, Flaviar and Casper, yeah, you can get it from them. Yeah. And, um, but but in, in many states, we're well distributed. So go to our website, look at, look at yeah. our um, distribution footprint. Less on the West Coast, but hopefully, um, but we do have a few spots. So, um, you know, always try your, your Drizzly apps or your mini bar. Um, you never know when it's going to pop up. But um, the best thing for us, I will just say, a lot of people ask, how can we support small business during this time? Go to your liquor store and say, hey, uh, I, know, <laughs> I know you carry Jack Daniels, but can you also carry this weird niche whiskey from new york and and that 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 helps us tremendously so if you have a good relationship with your store you know ask them to call in a favor and bring it in for you and you know lo and behold other people know the product we're we're uh, uh our our challenge has always been the consumer knows us but not always the retailer and the distributor who are in the middle and so the three-tier post-prohibition sort of landscape that we have to deal with, you know, uh, it's helpful if people kind of scoot those guys along and say, hey, this, if you bring this in, people will buy it. And so that's helpful to us for sure. Yeah, it's so important to spread that word uh, to the liquor stores, the bars, I completely agree. And uh, it's, it's creative whiskey, it's, it's complex. Uh, we feature your whiskeys on our wide whiskey educational tour. People always respond well to this, uh, and, and not just well, but they, they love the pita, they love the bourbon, the chocolate. Yeah. It's, it's such interesting stuff. So if you're a bourbon lover, you haven't tried it, give it a try. And Colin, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, kudos to you and your team for all you're doing during COVID, and thanks for joining us on our quarantine drinking team series. Yeah, thank you, Tom. I, I, you know, I see you all around the country. So it's, it's, uh, who knows where we'll meet next, but um, hopefully, hopefully it's not virtual. Hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll be having a drink with you face to face soon and seeing all these good folks. Look yeah. forward to it, my friend. Sounds good. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Colin. All right. Talk soon. And thank you all for joining us on Instagram's Bourbon Blogs Instagram. Join us tomorrow night, same time, 8 p.m. Eastern. I'm going to be talking with George Ramey of Camacho. The rest of the uh, the week is all up on bourbonblog.com. A week, basically a week out. And if you have any guests you want to see on our show, drop us a line, tom at bourbonblog.com. This will be up for 24 hours. So watch it in case you came halfway through, midway through, or you just want to watch it again. Tell your friends to watch it again. They probably need something to do while they drink their whiskey. Right? Cheers, y'all. Be safe and be well. <laughs>